views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of the station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Martini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show that's coming up right next. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everyone. This is our good news segment. You know, this is for us, a time to look at what's going on in the healthcare arena. What are some of the things that we could know more about and who are the people that are bringing the conversations out there? For example, today, you're going to hear from Dr. Paul Singh and Patrick Johnson, retired Air Force Reserve Colonel. Why? Because May is Stroke Awareness Month. But what you're going to hear are some little known facts about strokes. You're also going to hear the personal journey of Patrick Johnson, one of the least likely, at least in our minds, least likely people to have a stroke. Then we're going to share information to raise awareness of lung cancer. And this is also National Women's Lung Health Week. And so CVS Health Partners with American Lung Association's Lung Force to Beat Lung Cancer is here to helping communities go tobacco-free. Our guest is Papatia Tankut. He is the Vice President of Pharmacy Affairs for CVS and yes, Lung cancer is the number one cancer killer of women and men in the United States. And wait till you hear what he's got to say. And for those of you, and I have my friends as well, if you're wondering what we are doing to take care of our veterans, the people that are, that are abroad and in this country that are contributing to America, We are now being joined by National Commander of the American Legion, Charles E. Schmidt. And he's going to talk with us about what some of the challenges are. What do we face in our nation when it comes to caring for our vets? What are we going to do? And so today you're going to hear some important information from people that are on a mission so we can all be more aware and get involved. Stay tuned. Here we go. Welcome, everyone. I'm so thrilled to have Papa Tia Tanka joining me here today, Vice President of Pharmacy Affairs for CVS Health. We are talking about raising awareness of lung cancer during National Women's Lung Health Week. Uh, Papa Tia is Vice President, as I mentioned, but is responsible for engaging with nonprofit and health-based organizations to improve and enhance pharmacy care. Tankup began her career as a pharmacist at CVS Pharmacy in 1994. She has held various positions within the organization, including Vice President of Pharmacy Professional Services. Today, she's joining us in the role of helping the world understand what we can do to prevent lung cancer in women. I am so thrilled to have Vice President of Pharmacy Affairs at CVS Health join me here today, Papatia Tankut. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. You know, um, I think there is, uh, at least from my opinion, one of the very, very little known aspects of lung cancer. Uh, And some of the statistics are are really shocking. Can you give us, from your perspective, what do you think the public thinks they know but doesn't really know about lung cancer? 
Absolutely, and then I think it's um, it's very timely for us to have this discussion being yeah. National Women's Lung Week, and I think it's really um, alarming and shocking to know that there's very little awareness, particularly around women, around lung cancer and how it can impact them. And in fact, some of the statistics we share, you know, 98% of women don't even have lung cancer on their radar screen when they think about health concerns for themselves, yet eight every eight minutes a woman will lose their life and the battle with lung cancer, which is just absolutely shocking. You know, tell me something about the diagnosis of this, because um, most importantly, we think that we've come so far in diagnosing cancer and we lump all of the different cancers like into one bucket, but it's really not the case. Um, are we very good at diagnosing lung cancer um, uh, among women? But, you know, I think the key is to be able to diagnose and detect it early on. And that's something that we are hoping through our partnership with the American Lung Association with CVS Health to raise awareness around that. Because as of current day today, only 18% of lung cancer cases among women are diagnosed early. We know that when it is diagnosed early, the survival rates can be five times higher. And though, you know, anyone can get lung cancer, there's not one single attributable risk factor to lung cancer, but what we do know is smoking still remains the leading risk factor for lung cancer. Yeah, I mean, do, do you think that we are doing enough to raise the level of awareness right now about that? Um, I, I'm still pretty shocked at how many uh, people, especially young people, um, are still smoking. That's, Dr. Pat, you're exactly right, and I think that's the purpose of Lung Force. That's the purpose of why we've, you, you know, we've partnered with them to be a national presenting sponsor because we know we need that initiative of uniting women together, their families, their loved ones, young and old, to really stand together and, and raise awareness to fight lung cancer because there's a tremendous amount that still needs to be done and a tremendous amount of awareness that still needs to be out there that currently isn't today, and, and smoking kills, particularly particularly with lung cancer. It's a leading risk factor. And though we see over the last several years that the smoking rates have decreased, there are still 36 and a half million people in the U.S. that smoke today. And that's a, that's a big number of which that can lead to lung cancer. Yeah, it, it is a huge number, especially with what we know about it to date. Um, you, you know, I love that you're partnering with the American Lung Association's Lung Force. I, I really am thrilled sure. about this. Um, lung, uh, when I think about lung cancer, people, when you say lung cancer, it's probably one of the more scariest diagnoses to get. And yet, let me ask you this question. What are the differences between an early diagnosis and a not so early diagnosis? You have an early diagnosis of lung cancer can really improve survival rates five times higher when it's detected early. That's the real key takeaway here is that if we can, particularly with women and with all populations, if we can have people understand what the risk factors are, have greater awareness around lung cancer, that anyone can get lung cancer and we can get diagnosed early, detected early, it improves your survival rates five times higher. Oh my gosh, okay. I, I'm a woman. And here we are. What are what's at the top of your list when you're let's say you're talking to a group of women, which you're going to be in the show. What's your checklist? What do you want to say to women to go down the list and start checking off? Well, you know, the one thing I'd say is if you're a smoker, let's get you help and quit smoking right away. That's the yeah. number one thing. We know we know lung cancer can be caused by other factors outside of smoking, though that's a leading risk factor. We know radon, air pollution, and secondhand smoke can cause lung cancer. But the first 
you know, it's not easy, but the easiest way to do it is to quit smoking. So if we can help with online counseling that's provided by the American Lung Association's Freedom from Smoking program, if it's through nicotine replacement therapy that the CVS Health uh, pharmacist and nurse practitioners can help you with, that's my number one key there. The second is understanding and gaining greater awareness around your screening options, uh, ways to detect early, making sure you're in touch with your healthcare provider, and broader than that, as part of our broader campaign with Be The First, is helping to make our next generation tobacco free. Help your communities understand the risks of smoking, uh, the risks of how we can ensure that our next generation, our teens, our young adults are not smoking and we can keep our communities tobacco free. That's the focus we have with CVS Health's partnership with Lung Force. And we have a five-year, $50 million commitment dedicated to helping to deliver that first generation of tobacco-free, which every woman can help with doing in their own communities. You know, do you find in the work that you do um, that uh, the conversation between parents and children needs a little help? And what I mean by that is that, you know, as parents, we look around and we say, don't do drugs, don't drink alcohol. But I just don't know that we're having the please don't smoke conversation. What do you think? Well, you know, we we um, we made a conscious decision in an effort back three years ago to eliminate tobacco from our stores for that same exact reason. We know um, smoking is is bad, and there are many risk, uh, you know, and illnesses that can be caused by smoking. And we made a concerted effort to eliminate tobacco from our stores, and we started the effort of helping to educate teens, educating high school students and adults on how to have conversations, why you should stop smoking, and also then going forward with providing the resources and tools to teens and adults in our stores to stop smoking. And I think it's an ongoing conversation that doesn't end with one discussion. I think helping to rally communities around becoming tobacco-free is going to help with that discussion. But the same way we're looking to raise awareness around the, uh, the, the effects of lung cancer and why that's needs to be a public health priority, we've made it a mission within our organization to make quit smoking a national priority yeah. as well. Okay. You know, here's, here's the trick, I think, for, you know, having had a relative with lung cancer, for sure there, it was tricky. What are some of the signs that you would say to women to be mindful of? You know, because we don't really think, uh, at least my experience is, we don't really think, oh, wait a minute, I feel like this, I should go check for lung cancer. And I don't know that doctors are asking that question. What should women be more aware of that might be going on in their bodies? That's true. And I think with lung cancer, it's, you know, some people don't have um, symptoms until the disease is in its, is in its later stages. Uh, but there are some signs, that, but there might be some symptoms that might um, require you to think twice and, and reach out to a healthcare provider or a physician. And that might be a cough that just doesn't seem to go away, that might get worse. You might, might have a bit of uh, hoarseness that you typically don't have, a chronic cough sometimes labeled as a smoker's cough. Maybe you've had you know, frequent lung infections like bronchitis and pneumonia that don't seem to be that continue or recur, recur over and over again. And sometimes people don't go to see a physician because they attribute it to something else. Oh, I have a cold or I have pneumonia, I have allergies. But if you feel that it's persistent, if you feel that it's something that's getting worse, not better, it's always best to talk to your physician, your healthcare provider, just to have the early detection, early diagnosis, which is going to improve survival rates significantly. Wow. You know, there are so many things, and I know you're doing a lot of interviews and you're talking to a lot of people. Um, what would you say, as you, you keep sharing this message, what would you say to the folks that are out there that need to get some help around this or even the folks out there that might be thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm a woman. I have lung cancer. What now? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think what I would what I would say is learn as much as you can, and there are healthcare professionals at CVS pharmacy locations that can help you with again with particularly around smoking and. Um, 
you know, nurse practitioners and pharmacists that can help you with resources and tools to help smoking in our stores. Obviously, see a healthcare provider if you think that you might have the symptoms of lung cancer. And from a broader perspective, I'd encourage everybody in the month of May to stop at a CVS pharmacy, not only to get tools and resources, but also to donate to American Lung Association's Lung Force campaign, which is really going to raise those critical funds, not only for lung cancer awareness, but also for research and prevention. Oh, thank, you know, I want to thank you so much for all you're doing. I want to thank you for taking the time, you know, to take this message out there. And I have one last question. What's your personal message? What would you like to leave everyone with? Health is the most important thing you can think about. And, you know, our mission and mine as a pharmacist is to help people on their path to better health and do everything you can to stay healthy. If you're a smoker, quit. If you know someone who's smoking, get them help. And CVS Pharmacy can certainly help you do that. Wow. Thank you so very much for today. Thank you. We're going to take a short break, everyone. We'll be right back. traveling most of your day? Do you want to take Transformation Talk Radio with you anywhere you go? Well, guess what? There's an app for that. Just go to the App Store on your Apple device or the Google Play Store on your Android and search Transformation Talk Radio. Catch all of our live shows no matter where you are. Thanks for listening. Imagine a world where good news, oh, yeah! positive information and stories were the mainstream. Tell us your positive story. Hashtag positivity rules. You are listening to the Transformation Radio Network. Wow. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. This is Talk Radio to Thrive By. I'm telling you, I got to pinch myself some days because when each of us gets called to do something that we so not thought was in our real house to do for a purpose that's so much greater than us, we get to show up and shine. If you would like to show up and shine on the Dr. Pat Show as a co-host or sponsor, send us an email to inspire at the drpatshow.com. Listen while you work. Streaming live on any device. Tune in to the Transformation Radio Network. Visit transformationradio.fm. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show, talk radio to thrive by. I am so thrilled to be talking to all of you. We have got talk radio for all of us. Are you ready and willing and able to accept all of the abundance you can muster up in your life? Check us out at drpatcho.com, transformationtalkradio.com, transformationradio.fm. Oh, my goodness. Miss any shows during the week? Don't worry. We've got you covered. With the free Transformation Talk radio app, you'll have access to all of the past week's shows in the palm of your hand. Yeah! Tune in to Transformation Talk Radio anywhere you go with our free app for any of your devices. Check out our app in the App Store and Google Play Store today. Take us with you on that morning commute. Download your favorite podcast from the Transformation Radio Network. Just visit TransformationRadio.fm. Did you know that all of the shows on the Transformation Radio Network are available as podcasts to stream or download? Really? Check us out. Go to TransformationRadio.fm. We have business shows, spiritual shows, energy healing shows, and pretty much everything in between. Something for everyone guaranteed to inspire, educate, and transform. We are transforming the world one listener at a time.
Welcome, everyone. As I mentioned before, there's something that I'm extraordinarily passionate about and also is my very special guest today. National Commander of the American Legion, Charles Schmidt, joining me here today. You know, here we are. We're looking at the many, many people, not just in the in, in this country, but my family, your family, who have served. And the question really becomes, what are we doing to make sure that we don't forget the treatment of our veterans our fa and their families and what we can do to make this a priority to make America greater. Joining me here today is not just someone that's been passionate about this, but someone that clearly understands the nuances of what it means to be a veteran, but also what is absolutely important in discovering the issues that we face today. Um, you know, Commander uh, Schmidt, thank you for joining me here today. Now, now, listen, this is not just an important conversation, but we are concerned that the people that have served will be critically forgotten. In, and I wanted to thank you for what you're doing and give us a backdrop on why this is important here in this 100th anniversary of our entry into World War I. Well, uh, Dr. Pat, uh, it's uh, uh, extremely important to remember those who have served this country to preserve the freedoms and the democracy, which has become a way of life for every one of us in this great United States of America. You know, it's the American Legion, uh, the American Legion family. And when I talk about American Legion family, I'm talking about the Legionnaires themselves, the American Legion Auxiliary, the largest women's patriotic organization in the world. I'm also talking about the sons of the American Legion who are not veterans. Uh, well, some of them may have served, but it's a male descendant of a veteran who wants to honor veterans, and also honor the service of a mother and or father or grandparents in that case. But, you know, uh, it was the, the Doughboys that fought that first war uh, overseas, World War I, and a result, uh, as a result of them, uh, when they got ready to come home, there was no VA system at that time. Uh, and the concern of the leaders of the American Expeditionary Forces under Black Jack Pershing, leaders such as Teddy Roosevelt Jr. and uh, Hamilton Fish out of uh, New York, who later became a, uh, a congressman himself. Uh, there was even an Oregonian from uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel George D. White. They were all concerned about who's going to take mm -hmm. care of the boys, their buddies, those doughboys, when they got home. And, and of course, that evolved of uh, the caucus in May 15th, 1919, of discussing those issues, and thus the American Legion was born to not only take care of those uh, boys, and now it's men and women that have served and are serving, but to remember their services and honor their services. And, and thus, over the years, and on 98 years, our American Legion has been caring about veterans, honoring veterans, and to make sure that a grateful nation does not forget those who have served and are serving. And, and unfortunately, I think we'll probably still have many serving in the future based on what's going around on our globe. But it's our mission uh, of the American Legion to uh, still serve veterans and still serving of America. And that is through our advocacy programs uh, such as uh, the health care system and uh, the, those other benefits that the VA provides, education and career uh, opportunities, uh, career fairs. And, of course, we have great American Legion programs as well as the auxiliary does to, to help youth, give youth an opportunity, but also to teach them patriotism, uh, maybe of giving back and, and uh, serving our country because in the future – they're going to be the ones that are running this country, so we want to leave our country in the best hands that we can possible because every veteran has invested in America through their service through the military, and, and we yeah. want to leave America in good hands. And, of course, the bond that we established with one another over the years still is there, 
and we want to make sure that uh, our buddies are taken care of. Yeah, and you know, there's nothing quite like it because, you know, having experience with uh, growing up in a family where, you know, my relatives uh, have served and hearing what some of the struggles are, some of the challenges are, and thinking that perhaps a little naively on our part that, you know, yes, they went to war, yes, they served, yes, this is what happened, and they will be cared for. But there is very little that the public at large really does know about the challenges and the struggles today. And I wonder if you would touch upon them. Well, yes, there, there's um, a lot of things that the uh, general public don't know, uh, you know, about just about the service and sacrifices of uh, yeah. a veteran or even those that are serving today, uh, you know, uh, uh, Way the current conflicts are going, uh, it's uh, a lot of the uh, guard and reserve are uh, serving in those capacities, carrying uh, the, the majority of the load. And as a result of those uh, uh, that you know they're they're citizens, but then when their country calls, they go and they leave their job, they leave their family, and of course those deployments, as we call them now. Uh, are are long and some of them are even extended and that has an impact back home particularly on families on children and so forth and then of course they need to worry about in some cases when they come back home if their job is still there uh, and what has been the effects of the absence of that veteran on the family and so forth uh, and of course uh, it's it's just those many concerns, and not to mention um, those that have been in combat, the effects, the impact, uh, in mm -hmm. some cases, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, or TBI, yeah. traumatic brain injury, which have pretty much become the signature wounds of the Iraq-Afghanistan conflict. You know, how are they going to be treated? How are they going to be cared for? And I think... Um, Unlike the Vietnam veterans when they all came home, you know, how are they going to be accepted when they come back home? And I think uh, America's done a very good job since Vietnam. We've learned some lessons from Vietnam yeah. of uh, showing our appreciation to those men and women that come back and have, again, represented us, uh, particularly uh, in this global war on terror. You know, I wanted to ask you the, the the question and really get down into the weeds a little bit. Um, you know, I've heard stories from my own relatives, and, you know, these are still true. I mean, just to have, you know, our veterans be waiting to have their disability claims uh, adjudicated, you know, to really get the treatment. I think we're, you know, we're talking about clearly that there is some struggle for them and even declaring that they have a post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, to actually admit that they have that is one part of the, the situation. But mm -hmm. then if there is a health care uh, system that they need to use, that process in itself really needs to be looked at and revamped because, you know, to wait, you know, three, four, five years to have some disability claim recognized, that is just not acceptable. And and that's so true. That is unacceptable. And, uh, you know, first of all, that's why the American Legion continues to do what we do. And hopefully, Every veteran will kind of understand, have an understanding, even if they're not a member of the American Legion, of what we do. We advocate for veterans every day on Capitol Hill. That's mm -hmm. you know one of our primary concerns is to make sure that that health care system that the American Legion helped start back in the 1920s mm -hmm. is sustainable not only then but today to take care of those, as Abraham Lincoln said, as the born of battle. And, of course, it's yeah. the health care system in addition to education and, and employment, those claims and those appeals. And, yes, there are appeals mm -hmm. that are backlogged. And, and I must say, appeals 
requires greater scrutiny because it's like a second look on a claim that may have not been had an uh, outcome that uh, mm-hmm. that uh, the veteran would want. But the American Legion is on top of that. We have, even last year, one of our legislative priorities was to solve that appeals backlog. And thus, the American Legion advocated appeals modernization bill, which the VA took our suggestion, and they got several of the veteran service organizations to sit down and said, Let's put our heads together and see if we can resolve this, see if we can trim down that time but yet give the veteran full justice. And they did. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, they came up with a system that everybody agreed upon. How novel is that? And yeah, I think it's incredible. I think we could learn something. Uh, you know, I think our our our, uh, our our lawmakers could learn something from you all. Well, you you learn to learn. You go to the people who are going through those processes, experiences, those difficulties, and that's what you attack. That's what you yeah. go to solve to cure. But as a result of what happened. In October of this past year, the House of Representatives passed that, and of course we were anticipating, highly anticipating, that the Senate would get this approved before the 114th Congress ended. But unfortunately, Mm -hmm. America was focused uh, in uh, early November, if not even before, on the national elections. And of course, Congress went into recess, and the Senate didn't get a chance to address that. So along comes the 115th Congress now. And so that appeals modernization bill has to start over again. When I testified yes. before the House and, and uh, Senate Veterans Affairs Committee on March 1st, I told them 34 congressional lawmakers on that panel, the appeals modernization bill has to be passed and passed soon because, as you said, yes. and I said, that is unacceptable. Those oh, yeah. appeals... If it's nothing is done, those appeals, unfortunately, will outlive many of those veterans. Yeah, many yeah. of those veterans are waiting to hear because it's probably very much so a quality of life issue they are waiting on. Yeah, it actually, I have to tell you, Commander, it actually makes no sense, no matter what kind of piece of paper you pull out and try to rationalize this and the lack of attention that this getting, it just absolutely makes no sense. And so for those of us that get to talk with you, we want to thank you for your effort. How can people find out more about this? How can they get involved and support it? Well, first of all, um, we have a great webpage, www.legion.org. There you can learn about uh, so much about the American Legion, about our youth programs that gives those youth an opportunity. You can learn about our legislative priorities that, uh, that we advocate not only on behalf of Legionnaires, but for all veterans uh, that we continue to advocate. You can even sign up online and and learn about the uh, membership criteria to be eligible Mm -hmm. for a uh, membership in the American Legion. You can even find where the nearest American Legion post is in your town or in your state. Uh, The best thing that the citizen can do, regardless of a legionnaire or not, is contact their congressional representatives and share your concerns, share your interests, of those issues that are affecting the men and women that have served and are serving this country. Sometimes the grassroots can be heard, and we need to be heard. Yeah, absolutely. I I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I know that this is a, a short segment we have, and I just want to ask you one last question. What's your personal message? What do you want to say to the thousands of people listening to this show today? Well, first of all, I'm honored to be a national commander of the American Legion, but more important, it's about the men and women that uh, the American Legion advocates for, the men and women that have been called to action, have gone to action on our behalf to represent our country in places around the world. And as a grateful nation, we should never forget 
their service and, and of course, their sacrifice. And, and we're going to be in Normandy on June 6th this year to remember yeah. those sacrifices that took places oh. on those beautiful beaches and remember those that lie there in those beautiful cemeteries, which is a stark reminder of the sacrifices that have taken place so we can maintain our way of life, our freedom, and our democracies that we have in our country. And we should never forget those services and those sacrifices. And if nothing else, as a grateful nation, we need to honor those and remember those and take care of those that are still with us. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me here uh, today, Commander Schmidt. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, and we will make sure we pass the message on. Well, we certainly appreciate it. And it's an honor to uh, have a conversation with you this morning. And thank you for what you do and keeping attention on America's heroes. Yep. Uh, we, we're on it. <laughs> we're on it. Let's take a <laughs> short break, everyone. We'll be right back. <laughs> Are you traveling most of your day? Do you want to take Transformation Talk Radio with you anywhere you go? Well, guess what? There's an app for that. Just go to the App Store on your Apple device or the Google Play Store on your Android and search Transformation Talk Radio. Catch all of our live shows no matter where you are. Thanks for listening. Imagine a world where good news, oh, yeah! positive information and stories were the mainstream. Tell us your positive story. Hashtag positivity rules. You are listening to the Transformation Radio Network. Wow. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. This is Talk Radio to Thrive By. I'm telling you, I got to pinch myself some days because when each of us gets called to do something that we so not thought was in our real house to do for a purpose that's so much greater than us, we get to show up and shine. If you would like to show up and shine on the Dr. Pat Show as a co-host or sponsor, send us an email to inspire at the com. Listen while you work. Streaming live on any device. Tune in to the Transformation Radio Network. Visit transformationradio.fm. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show, talk radio to thrive by. I am so thrilled to be talking to all of you. We have got talk radio for all of us. Are you ready and willing and able to accept all of the abundance you can muster up in your life? Yeah. Check us out at drpatcho.com, transformationtalkradio.com, transformationradio.fm. Oh, my goodness. Miss any shows during the week? No. Don't worry. We've got you covered. Yeah. With the free Transformation Talk radio app, you'll have access to all of the past week's shows in the palm of your hand. Yes! Tune in to Transformation Talk Radio anywhere you go with our free app for any of your devices. Check out our app in the App Store and Google Play Store today. Take us with you on that morning commute. Download your favorite podcast from the Transformation Radio Network. Just visit TransformationRadio.fm. Did you know that all of the shows on the Transformation Radio Network are available as podcasts to stream or download? Really? Check us out. Go to TransformationRadio.fm. We have business shows, spiritual shows, energy healing shows, and pretty much everything in between. Something for everyone guaranteed to inspire, educate, and transform. We are transforming the world one listener at a time. Hey, everyone. 
everybody, you know, as I told you before, we are sharing information through our good news segments that were created. And May is Stroke Awareness Month. So here's what I want to say before I introduce you to Patrick Johnson, as well as Dr. Paul Singh. Here's what I want to say. Whatever you think you know about stroke, I'll think again. Dr. Paul Singh is joining me here today, Assistant Professor of Neuroendovascular Surgery and Vascular Neurology at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. He's Associate Director, the Comprehensive Stroke Center at the University Hospital, Co-Director, Primary Stroke Center at Newark, Newark Beth Israel Hospital. And then Patrick Johnson as well, retired Air Force Reserve Colonel, who is going to share his story and his journey in a way that perhaps you have not heard before. I want to thank both of you for joining us here today, Dr. Singh, and and of course, you know, Patrick, this is this is really one of the most eye-opening conversations and interview that I think I've had to date. So welcome to the show to both of you. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. I want to start out, if I could, with uh, you, uh, um, Patrick, if you don't mind. You know, here you are, retired colonel, uh, uh, Air Force, uh, and I'm quite familiar with what that means, having uh, having had my aunts and uncles in the Air Force. But here you are. You, as many others, see yourself as fit. You see yourself as somebody that is in the world. You're taking care of yourself. Um, everything says you are in top shape. And then something happens. Tell us in your words what that is. Well, actually, when I had the stroke, I was in the Air Force Reserve. Um, I was, uh, it was a typical day at, at work. I was the health director of uh, a public health department in Florida. And um, it was a normal day at work. I ran at lunch came home and had dinner with my wife, who's a nurse. Uh, my son, who's a nurse, was uh, visiting us. I went to bed that night. I woke up at 3.25 in the morning uh, to go to the bathroom, laid back down. Uh, my wife said, cuddle me, and I uh, responded by saying I can't move in a slurred speech. She turned on the light, asked me to smile. Um, she could tell I was having a stroke right away. Um, Two, and she called 911 uh, immediately because she knew time is brain. Uh, two days before that, I had my reserve weekend um, in, at Patrick Air Force Base, Florida. I took the physical fitness test, Air Force uh, test, and scored a 93 on that test, which is excellent. I'm a long-distance runner and vegetarian, and I did not consider myself a stroke candidate. Um, but that didn't matter to my wife. She dialed 911 immediately because she knew I was having a stroke. Mm. And, you know, isn't this why we're having this conversation? As I said at the top of the hour here, it was it's about everything you think you know about stroke. We have to think again, don't we? Thank you, Patrick, you know, you know for that. Dr. Dr. Singh, I, I want to ask you about this. You, you know, that you just heard the story. I'm sure you've been doing these interviews. I mean, aren't we clearly uninformed about stroke? what to do, and how it happens. Um, I do think, because especially in the setting of being May, being Stroke Awareness Month, the public needs more information about what stroke actually is. Yeah. Uh, stroke is the leading cause of, cause of disability in this country. Um, it's also the fifth leading cause of death in this country. And realizing that it does, doesn't happen to someone else, it can happen to anyone at any time, and that stroke doesn't discriminate is a really, really important take-home message as well. Yeah, I mean, isn't one of the least known bits of information that people in the United States experience a stroke more than a heart attack? I mean, isn't that shocking to people That's listening right. here because they don't know that? That's right. I mean, if you look at the statistics, uh, which we don't like to call it often, but uh, somebody has a stroke one in every 40, uh, once every 40 seconds. And they have a heart attack one every 43 seconds. Mm -hmm. And for women that are listening to this, you know, uh, even though, you know, you're going to hear a little bit more from Mr. Mr. Johnson here today is women. Wait a minute. 
you know, twice as many many women uh, uh, experience stroke and die from it, actually, than breast cancer. I mean, this kind of information people just don't know about. They just don't know about this. That's right. Mm. Um, you know, Mr. Johnson, for you, as uh, as you're now taking this journey and taking the message out there, were you shocked to find out about some of this information? Well, yes, I've been uh, I've become a student of stroke, and the more I uh, learn about stroke, uh, the more I realize that anybody can have a stroke. Mm-hmm. How has your recovery been? Tell us about that for yourself. Well, my stroke was severe, um, and um, going into the hospital, um, it was uh, I was fortunate because I got to the hospital very promptly. I was medicated in the uh, uh, correct time frame. Um, it was a bit of a blur the first 24 hours, but I um, was able to walk with assistance fairly uh, soon, and I progressed pretty rapidly. I got out of the hospital. Um, within four days and I uh, got to work uh, actually a week later, um, which is a little too quick. Um, I did have to sleep uh, more than usual um, and I started running two months afterwards. I did have to get a pacemaker implanted um, soon after the stroke, um, but my recovery was um, for all uh, intents and purposes from my perspective, fairly miraculous. Yeah. Wow. You know, Dr. Singh, from your point of view, let's talk about uh, if we could, you know, let's talk about what people should know about this. And, you know, I was a little shocked to find that there is actually something called, you know, a stroke belt in the United States, really, really in an area that my relatives are living in. I mean, I don't even understand how any of that is possible. What is it from a medical point of view people should know here? Sure. Uh, it's a great question, Dr. Pat. Um, before we even start this, it's good to know that what the risk factors are for stroke. Yeah. So some of the common risk factors that we, that we talk about with our patients are high blood pressure, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, high cholesterol, um, high blood sugars or diabetes, and then one that's easily modifiable is smoking. Um, those risk factors are some of the biggest ones, not only for stroke, but also for heart attack. And a lot of these come from our lifestyle. So it depends on the diet that we have and the lifestyle as far as exercise and activity. Well, in the South, and I, just like your relatives, I was raised in the South. Yeah. Uh, the, food, the food is amazing. Uh, yeah. the, uh, there's, but unfortunately, there's a lot of salt, uh, which can lead to hypertension, and there's a lot of cholesterol uh, and a lot of fatty foods um, that lead to hypercholesterolemia. Uh, and we see a lot more of this south of the Mason-Dixon line in the United States. And because of this, there simply is just a lot more stroke in that region of the country because the risk factors are just that much more prevalent. Yeah. And, you know, for people listening, as I said earlier, I mean, there's a lot we don't know about this. What are some of the early signs? Can we actually, I mean, clearly, Mr. Johnson, in your case, clearly, you know, there weren't, quote, early signs that I can tell. But are there such things, Dr. Singh, are there such things as early signs? There definitely are, and this should be some of the take-home message that we we take away from Stroke Awareness Month is what are these early signs. We use the acronym FAST, S-A-S-T. The F in this acronym stands for face drooping. So specifically what we're looking for is if one side of the face is not moving as well as the other side. The A stands for arm weakness. So one arm may not be moving at all, or it just might be suddenly weak. The S stands for speech. And with speech, we're specifically saying that the, it might be garbled, it might be slurred, or somebody might not be able to get words out or have a tough time getting words out. Now, the 90% of stroke patients have at least one of these symptoms at the onset of the stroke, so it really does encompass a lot of the early signs. The T in this acronym stands for time, and that's because the therapies that we can administer that are stroke rescuing um, are very time sensitive. And so, Patients or their families or bystanders need to call 911 as soon as they see the signs and symptoms in FAST, and they can be taken by EMS to a facility that can administer uh, early therapies. 
Yeah, you know, I think that there are people that, you know, unless there is a celebrity that's been affected by it, we don't really give it much attention. And I'm also very aware how family doesn't know what to do. Mr. Johnson, for you, you were very fortunate, right? You know, you had people that were um, that knew what to do. What is your message to, to people listening today, especially people that may not have the kind of family that have was so as smart as yours? <laughs> Well, the, the first thing is to recognize the signs and symptoms of stroke. I've read a lot about stroke. I read about a gentleman who um, had a stroke on an airplane, and people around him thought he was um, drunk, unfortunately. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, it's recognizing the signs of the stroke and uh, the acronym FAST. And uh, the other thing is uh, I, I do believe that my recovery was um, – related to my uh, my health state and so getting okay. healthy now improves your chances of uh, a positive outcome i do think uh eating healthy and exercising for any of us depending on what uh curveball life uh, throws at us uh will help uh, our outcome now, I want to ask you both, there are folks listening, and they're going to want to find more information. What What is the best place for people to go to do that? Because we do need to stay abreast of, of how to be more aware. So there's a website. It's pretty easy to remember that they can go to for more information, and it's strokecall911.com, and you can get more information there. Um. So here, here's kind of the question I want to kind of go to here. Um, you talked about there being a stroke belt. Are there predispositions? You know, now we're looking at DNA. Now we're looking, you know, I just think that stroke is really elusive for a lot of people. No, you're absolutely right. There's, so when we talk about the causes of stroke, there, there are many, many, many causes of stroke. Um, and sometimes it can be in patients that don't have the typical risk factors that we just discussed earlier for stroke. Right. Uh, but the modifiable risk factors are the ones that are really, really important to hone in on because the stroke belt that we're talking about, the reason why it's so high is because those risk factors are prevalent, and those risk factors actually lead to some other additional risk factors that can lead to stroke as well. Yeah, absolutely. I want to ask each of you, I know these by these interviews fly by. I want to ask each of you one last question, starting out with you, Mr. Johnson. If you don't mind, what is your personal message? What would you what would you like to leave us with? Well that anybody can have a stroke. Um and I I do believe that um you you have to look at um uh that as uh, something that folks don't understand. Um I do think uh, I work with, um, I'm an Air Force uh, nurse, and I work with wounded warriors in Iraq, and I've worked with them in Germany. And I did that, go back to that message, being healthy beforehand and with a healthy diet and exercise can improve your outcome no matter what ha comes your way. And um, it's time to work to get healthy now. It can only help you when um, when adversity comes our way. Mm. Wow. Dr. Singh, every day you live in this world. What do you want to say to folks? So stroke in 2017 is not like it's ever been in the past. Mm. And there, there are things we can do in 2017 we couldn't do 20 or 30 years ago. And information, public awareness about what these signs are and then urgently getting the therapy to both prevent and treat stroke as fast as we can is what's going to decrease the morbidity from stroke in this country. Mm. Wow. Thank you both so much. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, it's an well, important you, message. Wow. Let's take a short break, everyone. We'll be right back.
Transformation Talk Radio is dedicated to the education and awareness of Lyme disease. Welcome to Lyme Talk Radio. I'm Dr. Pat Vasily, the host of the Dr. Pat Show, and I am so thrilled that we've created this venue for all of you out there. Dr. Pat Vasily will be bringing the most innovative, groundbreaking information, research, treatment innovations, and stories from those it affects every day. What we have heard is that you want to ensure for us that we keep positive, holistic, uplifting, transformative talk radio on the air. We're excited to bring you the contemporary conversations about Lyme disease. We promise not to let the light fade on Lyme. So fasten your seat belts. We've got lots more to share with you in the weeks to come. Tune into Lyme Talk Radio with Dr. Pat and help keep our mission strong on TransformationTalkRadio.com.